From Norway to the Balears, from the Atlantic to the Black Sea, the landscape and seascape is riddled with pits, cavities, and caverns. Some of these lead to solid rock after just a few meters, but others lead to unfathomable abysses, endless labyrinths. The underground treasures of Europe are undoubtedly among the most well-explored, well-known, and fabulous in the world. On the island of Crete, there's an enormous gap on the northern flank of Mount Tikti, at the center of the island. According to Greek mythology, Zeus was born in the depths of this very cave. As early as 2000 BC, and for centuries afterward, men came here to worship the king of the gods. These roughly cut rocks at the mouth of the cave served as altars. Over the ages, thousands of sacrifices were performed here. Marked by a sign from Zeus or an apparition of the Virgin Mary, caves have often been associated with religion and mysticism. In the French Jura Mountains at Romoneau, a cavity that leads into a small underground stream has been transformed into a chapel. The spot has been a shrine since the 7th century. But long before man had any metaphysical preoccupations, he took interest in these caves. Early man lived in caves because they solved some of his most urgent problems. They sheltered him from the cold, they protected him from wild animals, and they were observation posts from which he could watch passing herds. Dry and generally small caves were prehistoric man's prime refuge. At this spot, in the Dordogne region in France, a limestone cliff overlooks the Vézières River Valley. The walls of St. Christopher Rock have been carved out along almost a kilometer. Archaeological digs have shown that Cro-Magnon men lived in these rock-covered shelters 40,000 years ago. They even painted the walls, but none of the paintings have survived. The succession of inhabitants and changes through the centuries have obliterated them all from St. Christopher Rock. We were at last able to appreciate ancestral European talent when some dark, well-preserved caves were discovered in the 19th century. Europe has some of the most beautiful cave paintings in the world. these world-renowned paintings at Lascaux for the first time is a thrilling experience. Swiss author Jean-Claude Laloux described it well. A nothing suffices, and we suddenly feel as if an old, long-lost brother is at our side. We take his hand and follow him into the maze of his cave sanctuary. Man was not the only mammal that sought shelter in caves. The cave bear was a regular underground visitor. It was the largest carnivore in Europe in the Quaternary era. We can get an idea of how incredibly strong this animal was thanks to the bones found in caves, particularly those in southern Germany in the Karlsruhe region, 
or here in the Ursulor Caves in Romania. Cave bears sometimes adventured far into these underground galleries. Here they were sheltered from the cold, but the humidity in the depths helped propagate disease. Cave bears, having no predators, became increasingly lazy. They moved around less, and this led to greater inbreeding and eventually to the end of the species. The last cave bear died 10,000 years ago, perhaps at the end of one of these dark tunnels. Caves occur most frequently in mountains that are karstic, in other words, composed of limestone. Such mountains are common in Europe. Karst regions, whether they be in Italy, Greece, or Yugoslavia, have certain characteristics in common. They're generally riddled with caverns, have a rough terrain, and are not very fertile. So they're hardly favorable to agriculture, unless it's raising a few sheep. Shepherds prefer staying away from these dark holes. Not only because there's a high risk of sheep getting lost in them, but also because these caves are said to be the home of evil spirits, monsters, and elves. Caves have given rise to a thousand legends. One particular tale takes place in southern France, in the heart of the Hero Canyons. A farmer lived here on the river bank with his wife and children, all of his children, that is, except one, his oldest son, who worked as a shepherd high on the plateau, watching the flocks on the coast, as it's called here. To keep himself busy, the lonely young shepherd whittled stick after stick. With a few quick strokes, he'd carve a rough sign and toss his rough handiwork into a big opening in the plateau. One day, walking down into the valley to visit his parents, he was surprised to discover several sticks he'd carved floating in the Eru. Having discovered there was a link between the opening on the plateau and the river, he used this odd waterborne postal system to communicate with his mother when he returned to his flocks. But one day, the young boy fell into the hole while trying to rescue one of his sheep. Later, down in the valley, his poor mother found her son's lifeless body floating in the calm waters of the Harrow River. The gorges echoed a long time with her laments. This legend is the origin of the name of this now famous cave, the Klamus, which in the local dialect means the Howler. The region in a 100 kilometer radius around the Klamus is filled with underground marvels unlike anything in the world.
Water created all these caves, and it also performed its magic on the surface in these landscapes. The Bonho River snakes for a few kilometers across the surface of a limestone plateau. Bonheur means happiness, and as its name indicates, the river flows along peacefully until it runs up against the face of a cliff and plunges into the plateau. Here, the Bonheur gives us a unique illustration of active underground erosion. The Bonheur begins its underground route in a vast rectangular passageway, almost 15 meters wide. At the other end of this incredible tunnel, the stream can be seen again at the bottom of a sinkhole, a kind of gigantic skylight formed by the collapse of an underground chamber. In the middle of the sinkhole debris, the Bonheur makes a 90 degree turn, then disappears into the depths of the earth. Everything here is Dantesque and sinisterly beautiful. The riddled rock, worn over the ages by tides of wild currents, echoes with the din of thrashing waves. The river beats against the walls, foams up and erupts, cascading in an apolyptic dark line and releasing a frightening bellow that rises to heaven. At the end of this underground journey described by poet Ralph Perrault, the bonheur is no more. The stream loses its identity in the rocky labyrinth that extends for several kilometers into the mountain. When it re-emerges from this stunning opening in the cliff, it's called the Brahmabiu, the Wailing Ox. In several thousand years, no doubt, the river will have done its work, enlarging the underground galleries until the vaults collapse and turning the cavern into a canyon where the bonheur will once again flow in the clear light of day. This landmark is entirely unique. Specialists have not found any other like it in the world. Bramabio fascinated Édouard Alfred Martel, a major 19th century figure. A man of passion, Martel risked his life many times during underground explorations. Martel is considered the father of speleology. He discovered the underground river at the well of Padirac, the most frequently visited chasm on earth. The southeastern and western slopes of France's Massif Central are exceptional for the quality and number of their caves, caverns and cavities. Half the French territory is covered with calcium carbonate rock, limestone, that lends itself to cave formation. This limestone is the reason for France's fabulous underground treasures. The Pyrenees mountain range has a considerable number of caves. There are many dizzying pits and impressive chasms in these mountains. In fact, there are many underground cave networks that cross the French-Spanish border. This is the case with the complex system at Pierre Saint-Martin, which reaches a depth of 1,342 meters. There are still other underground wonders to discover in France. Farther east, in the Alpine Piedmont Mountains, we find this crest, rising like the ramparts of a veritable fortress, the Vercors Range. These dizzying cliffs are composed of very old limestone, several hundred meters thick, that has been carved, fissured, and eaten away by rainwater. Mount Aiguille lifts its remarkable silhouette on the eastern edge of the Vercors. It looks a bit like an outpost. It was separated from the Vercors when the cliffs receded. As a counterpoint to this monolith rising in the sun, the Vercors also has its darker world of gorges, hollows and chasms. Speleologists have counted more than 1,500 openings to underground galleries or caves. For them it's a veritable paradise. This rectangular rock arcade overlooks two enormous erosion basins. They give their name to the cave from which spring the waters of the Germ River. According to legend, the Sassenage cisterns are the lair of Melusine. Melusine is a mythical water fairy. Hidden inside her unfathomable rock maze 300 meters up, she reigns over these cascades. 
The water in this spring filtered down from the Sornau Plateau, then flowed into the underground galleries of the Berger Chasm before reappearing here on the surface. The mouth of the Berger Chasm lies above the Sassenage cisterns. The chasm drops 1192 meters below ground level. One of the deepest cavities in the world, it's a major speleological attraction. The exploration of caves began in Europe, and the first written record of an underground cavity being explored was found in the famous Postojnska Jama in Slovenia. The inscription was carved more than a kilometer from the entrance in the year 1213. More recently, speleological federations in Slovenia, Austria, and France played an important role in exploring these dark underground realms. Miners, as early as the 16th century, were the first to explore the caves of England. They had to have a lot of courage and tenacity, because English caves are often narrow, difficult and dangerous. At that time, the material and techniques for underground exploration were rudimentary. Early spelunkers made slow progress and faced real dangers. A far cry from today's modern cavers. Interest in these dark passageways only grew slowly and often indirectly. In the 18th century, the Germans adventured into these underground realms simply to pursue their archaeological research. Meanwhile, however, systematic exploration of the Old World's caves had begun. Today, the major European speleological federations are a century old. Thousands of kilometers of galleries have been explored, and numerous caves are open to the public. This subterranean environment is unique. Nothing on the Earth's surface can compare with it. Naturally, caves aroused the public's interest and led to the development of tourism in these underground realms. Promising mystery and hidden wonders, many caves were outfitted for tourists long ago. Equipment was sometimes complex, sometimes rudimentary. This underground world was opened to the European public as early as a hundred years ago. The Dobsina Cavern in eastern Slovakia has been open to tourists since 1871. At an altitude of 970 meters on the slopes of a limestone mountain in the Slovakian paradise, Dobsina was the first cave in the world to be electrified. As early as 1887, visitors could view the stunning ice formations lining the interior of the cave, thanks to artificial lighting. The ice is 25 meters thick in some places. Its volume is estimated at 150,000 cubic meters. But this figure varies because the ice mass changes every year. The cave is almost 1.5 kilometers long, but only 475 meters of it are open to the public. As in all caves that have been opened around the world, each room, each oddity has been named. This is the passage over hell. This is the chapel. This is the ice corridor. The Great Hall measures 120 meters in length and is 60 meters wide. The ceiling is 11 meters high.
but the Ruffini hallway is Dobsina's most stunning feature. This space between the ice and the limestone wall of the mountain used to be entirely filled with ice. A relatively warm draft that flows from the bottom of the cave slowly melted the ice, conveniently creating this useful passageway. Most of the caves open to the public in Europe are easily accessible, comfortable, and spectacular. Artificial falls have been installed in certain caves to show their full beauty, even during the dry season. Not only are these caverns attractive, they also offer another advantage. They provide revenue from tourism to otherwise rather impoverished limestone regions where caves are sometimes the only wealth. And they protect other subterranean landmarks from damage that can be caused by large numbers of tourists. The mouth of this cave in the Tenen Mountains, south of Salzburg, Austria, is located at an altitude of 1,650 meters. There's a cableway to get us there. The difficulty of equipping the Ice Heisenwelt caves and the investments required were considerable, but well worth it for this incredible experience. These famous caverns in the Tenen Mountains offer tourists one of the most fabulous spectacles in the world. At the foot of this limestone cliff is the mouth of the Agtelic Caverns, the largest in Hungary. This cavern has gained international fame for its incredible 24 kilometer long network of galleries. The cave extends five kilometers into Slovakia, where it is called Domika Cavern, and is also open for tourism on that side of the border. These caves are part of the most far-reaching cave network in all of Europe. They were probably inhabited in the Stone Age. The Baralda cave has been open to the public since the 19th century. Today, it attracts over 250,000 visitors each year. The Baralda's most impressive features are its huge chambers and large concreted formations. These shapes, underscored by the play of shadow and light, kindle the imagination.
In the most beautiful European caverns open to the public, the dark, inert rock is lit up, brought to life, literally put on stage. In fact, it's not the caves that we are shown, but their walls, since caves are by definition nothing but emptiness. This little train runs in Belgium. It regularly leaves the village of Ans sur Les to carry its passengers to the foot of the Boine Hill. At the top is one of the major landmarks on the cave tourists map. For almost a century now the Vicinal rail line has been shuttling tourists back and forth between the village and the caverns. In fact, these caves were already famous in the 19th century. As early as 1860, Scientists, writers, a handful of tourists, and adventurers of all breeds were involved in exploring these caves. At that time, they were called the greatest natural oddity in the world. Victor Hugo praised them, and Georges Sand was moved to write, It's an alpine chaos buried in a chaos. It's a vision of a shattered mountain within a mountain. Today, one enters the cave through a natural opening, Saltpeter Hole. The river that flowed through the mountains long ago disappeared into the earth at this spot. The Hans sur Les caverns have been equipped to ensure the visit is comfortable and spectacular. In a few hundred meters, one can get a view of everything caves have to offer. Careful lighting and well-informed guides enhance the experience of these stunning formations. The river is one of the highlights of the visit, particularly because there are electric boats and it's possible to sail down the Les River for a few hundred meters. Traditionally, a cannon is fired at the end of the journey as visitors sail out into the open air. Winter and summer alike, 300,000 visitors every year thrill at this rebirth on the less. The greatest attraction of Hans sur Les is that it makes it easy to understand the subterranean world of caves. The limestone in which the river carved out these caves dates from the Paleozoic era, about 360 million years ago. These fossils are the remains of invertebrates that lived in a warm, shallow ocean, or to be exact, a lagoon protected by a great coral reef. They date from a time when Belgium was covered by the sea.
scientific research and core samples from the cave enable us to better understand the Earth's history, both its distant and recent past. Most of the concreted formations developed after the last ice age, less than 10,000 years ago. Researchers have used carbon-14 dating to measure the growth rates of these formations. They're highly variable, from 2 millimeters to 10 centimeters per century. One can imagine how long it took for calcite deposits to create this spectacular stalagmite-covered floor. Whenever a drop of water falls from the cave ceiling, it leaves a minute quantity of calcite on the ground. Imperceptibly, over the decades and centuries, these calcite deposits build up, forming stalagmites. Their shapes depend on many factors, such as the characteristics of the cave floor, the slope, and the height from which the drops of water fall. Every stalagmite is unique. Sometimes they stand alone, and often they have extraordinary shapes. This barren landscape contains one of the most beautiful groups of stalagmites in the world. There is a vertical shaft in the Maison Plateau at this spot. At the bottom, 75 meters down, the shaft opens onto an enormous cavity that holds a veritable forest. The virgin forest, as it's called, is composed of 400 stalagmites. These stone trees have amazing shapes. Some of them reach 25 meters in height. Each formation is more incredible than the last. Arabesques, needles, palms, and graceful tapirs that look as if they're made of stacked ice cream cones. Stalagmites take on these complex shapes because the cave's water resources and the levels of calcium carbonate in the water vary. The water droplets that form on the cave roof are, in fact, composed of rainwater that has filtered down from the surface. It picks up carbon dioxide in the topsoil, and as it seeps into the limestone bedrock, the carbon dioxide provokes a chemical reaction. It transforms the limestone into calcite, the raw material from which the decorative shapes in caves are made. They're called travertine formations. Thus, the growth of these beautiful formations depends enormously on the land, climate, and the vegetation on the surface. If the ground is frozen, rainwater can't filter down through the fissures in the limestone. If there's not much vegetation on the surface, the seeping water will contain little carbon dioxide. Keeping these two principles in mind, it's easy to guess which European countries have the most numerous and the most elaborate cave formations. Yugoslavia, France, and Spain have temperate climates. In places where the land is covered with prairies, scrub, and few trees, the rainwater filters slowly through the topsoil, which is composed of bits of rock and decomposing organic matter. It picks up large quantities of carbon dioxide along the way. Caves in these regions often have remarkable travertine deposits. On the other hand, in karstic regions with colder climates, like England, the limestone slabs have been literally plain smoothed by glaciers, 
and because there's no vegetation on the surface, few caves here have formations, and they're often limited in shape. After water filters through the limestone bedrock into an underground cavity, it collects in droplets on the ceiling, where it comes in contact with the cave's atmosphere. Chemically, the air in the cave is very much like air above ground. There's less carbon dioxide in the air than is dissolved in the suspended water droplets. This disequilibrium results in a reaction. The carbon dioxide in the droplets is diffused into the cave atmosphere. But this means the water is then too heavily loaded with dissolved calcium carbonate, and a calcite precipitate is formed. A minute ring of calcite is deposited on the ceiling around the droplet. And drop by drop, all these little rings build up and form these very fragile transparent tubes, sometimes called macaroni. When the hollow core of this tube gets clogged, the droplets continue to flow, but they run down the outside. The tube grows thicker and longer and becomes a stalactite. Stalactites and stalagmites are but two of the different types of travertine deposits. This flat, circular formation, embellished with its own stalactites, hangs from the vault of a chamber in Cabrispin. It's called a disc, a rather rare type of calcite deposit that can sometimes reach several square meters in size. A disc is formed along the same general principles as a macaroni, but instead of flowing from a single hollow core, the droplets seep between layers in the rock. The path which the water follows directly determines the shapes of the formations. On sloping cave walls, the water flows heavily down the steepest inclines and around obstacles. The first few million droplets flowing down the walls builds a sort of crystalline crest reflecting the cave topography. As the droplets continue to flow, they follow the same path and amplify the process. That's how these marvelous drapery formations called flowstone were created. The rock looks as if it's infinitely supple. We can see beautiful examples of these spectacular formations in the Punkevi Cave in Czechoslovakia, the Shatter Cave in the Mendif Mountains in England, and the Djabaz Cave north of Budapest in Hungary. Sur Les Caverns not only have magnificent specimens of draperies, but also fine examples of anthodites. Anthodites are formed when pools build up behind precipitated calcite dams. When the pool overflows, a calcite deposit is left behind on the rim, adding another minute layer to the rimstone wall. This veritable mineral lace in the coral chamber of the same cave in Belgium is composed of a series of small pools that have grown through capillary action. They're called microanthodites. As each drop falls, the pearl spins, thickening its coat of alabaster. There are few caves open to the public where this phenomenon can be seen. At Trabuc, a cave in southern France, the calcite formations grow very rapidly. 
Little by little, a few grains of rock dust at the bottom of this little pool are covered with concentric layers of white calcite, creating what's called a cave pearl. Sometimes, strange formations that seem to defy the law of gravity cling to cave walls or to stalactites themselves. The rock streamers, spurs, and crystals that flourish in this disorderly hanging garden are called helictites. Like macaronis, they're hollow and formed when evaporating droplets deposit a ring of calcite on the extreme end. But the core of a helictite is so minute that the water flows by capillary action, so their shape does not depend on gravitational pull. In the Mulis Cave in the Pyrenees region, there are some incredibly beautiful crystals. Here, instead of calcite, it is aragonite, another atomic structure of calcium carbonate. Aragonite can also take on twisting shapes, but it is when it crystallizes in large needle shapes that it is the most spectacular. In the Cabrispin Cave, there are fabulous, perfectly white bouquets blooming on the walls. The richness and beauty of these crystalline shapes created by capillary action is absolutely stunning. In nearby Limousis Cave, clusters of aragonite have formed an enormous chandelier set to be the largest in the world. This masterpiece was sculpted by water, the delicate, patient work of a master craftsman. But water can also work in heavy, powerful strokes. Just like rivers above ground, underground streams cut into and wear away their stone beds, deepening them with powerful whirlpools, cascades and rapids. Sand, gravel and bits of rock carried by the stream chip away at the limestone, creating an incredible din that contrasts with the silence of dry chambers and galleries. At the end of its extraordinary dark journey, the torrent reappears somewhere in the open air, its waters calm or raging. This thundering roar is the sound of a small river, barely several kilometers long, coming to life in the Jura Mountains. This is the Lison River. The Lison surges out into the sunlight from an enormous opening cut into the limestone cliff. The Lison Spring is one of the most beautiful examples of this phenomenon that can be seen in Europe. Several kilometers away, the Lison runs into the Loup, whose source is just as spectacular. The origin of these rivers was for a long time an unsolved mystery, until one day in 1901 when several tanks of absinthe exploded on the banks of another river, the Dubes, and the green, anise-scented beverage turned the loo into a smelly, jade-colored cocktail. Because underground streams are generally fed by rainwater, the river's output at these openings varies considerably with the seasons. This sometimes results in spectacular changes in landmarks. An immense basin lies at the foot of the high limestone cliffs in Fontaine de Vaucluse, France. In fact, it's the opening of an enormous vertical shaft at least 110 meters deep. The water level can rise here spectacularly during the flood season. But this is the dry season, and the cavity at the end of the shaft is almost empty. When the underground stream that feeds it fills with melting snow and spring rains, the water rises in the basin, surging from the bottom of the chasm as if it were spurting from a giant garden hose. The phenomenon is so remarkable that all underground rivers which reappear from ascending conduits 
are known as Vauclusian springs. When the water begins to rise, not only does it fill the basin, but it sometimes overflows, periodically forming a rumbling torrent. At the low water mark, in other words, when the spring is flowing at its lowest level, the underground stream creates a spring below the mass of fallen rock. The flooded Fontaine de Vaucluse chasm was explored by speleologists in diving suits as early as 1878. Later, remote control devices were used to explore the shaft down to 105 meters. Sumps and submerged galleries are obstacles to cave exploration, but they're also invitations to discover intact primitive worlds. Submerged underground caverns are probably the last uncharted territories of the European continent. Every year, several dozen kilometers of new galleries are explored. This kind of subterranean exploration requires not only skills in underwater diving, but also special speleological expertise. The Swiss are the uncontested masters of subaquatic speleology, followed closely by the Belgians, the English, and the French. In the Fatima Plateau of Portugal, a French team is exploring the submerged Almonda cave network. This is the largest cave in Portugal, and one-third of the galleries are flooded. The divers here explore the cave at a depth of 15 to 30 meters. Safety measures are extremely strict. Two tanks, two regulators, multiple lights on helmets, safety ropes, and the one-third rule, which stipulates that divers use one-third of their air tanks for the trip down, one-third for the trip back, and keep one-third as a safety reserve. This kind of encounter during a cave dive is rather uncommon. This leather carp is probably very old, and he's taken up lodging at the entrance of a small submerged cave network. He won't risk adventuring into the deep sumps or galleries. There's nothing there for him to eat, and he wouldn't be able to survive. Rare and strange fish, perfectly adapted to subterranean life, are the exclusive inhabitants of deep cave chasms. This is the most extraordinary animal in European caverns. It lives in the underground rivers in the Postonia region in Slovenia. It's known as a manfish and related to the Mexican axolotl, not only does it have four strange legs, but it is also blind and has non-pigmented skin. Except for their external gills, they're entirely white. They're batrachia and can grow up to 30 centimeters in length. They're easy to please. They feed on bacteria and organic waste.
There are about 30 species of chiropters in Europe. The word literally means winged hands. Although all caves don't have bats living in them, the flying mammals are undoubtedly the animals most often associated with the underground realm of caves and caverns. Bats' communal lifestyles and complex radar system show how highly developed they are. However, Europeans in the past often nailed live bats to barn doors to protect their animals, out of fear and ignorance. We were unaware of what elegant pilots bats are, just as we were unaware of the wealth and beauty of the world's caves and caverns. The bat is a symbol of man's ambivalent relationship with this dark underground universe, sometimes called the Eighth Continent.